All right. Welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. Or if you're calling in from China, joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Alex Ford. I think I recognize a lot of the folks who are dialing in, so I, it's, it's good to hear from you again. Um, this, just a, just a quick introduction on what we're up to today, why we're going to do it, uh, and who's joining us to talk about this report. Uh, on uh, the recovery and the impact of the uh, COVID-19 virus on China. Um, so first of all, we're going to try a little bit of a different format today. Um, so rather than just a webinar, we're going to kind of do more of an interview, keep this a little more casual, uh, does not need, not particularly long. Um, but uh, you know, for a lot of ways, this is as much an opportunity for our team to pursue you know, our interests, um, you know, research about China, uh, as it is an opportunity to share that with all of you. Um, I'd also want to add that I imagine uh, a lot of you right now are having a, we're all working from home. Uh, it, we're, we're probably not having the easiest time unplugging. Uh, we're probably faced with a lot of very you know, negative news in general uh, and not a lot of optimism about what's going to happen next. Um, and, you know, in order to get a little bit away from that, I thought this would be a great topic for us to start with, start seeing how China's recovering, uh, maybe see some of what is, lies ahead for us in that, um, and, you know, give ourselves a bit of a mental vacation, as I know a lot of folks who have been working, you know, very long days and everything's an emergency, uh, to kind of take a step back before they go right back into that this, after, this evening or if you're calling in from China this morning. Um, so just a, a, a little bit on the, uh, the format, um, we would love to have people ask questions as we go through this, if you're interested. Uh, for the most part, just stay on mute. Um, and what we're going to do is, uh, in the chat, as we go through topics of this report, we're going to dive into the report here in just a moment, um, love for you to just type whatever questions you'd like us to address. Um, if you see a question uh, and you really think that's a good one, you want to see that answer, um, just, you know, copy and paste it, add plus one, uh, or if you miss it, just rewrite the question. <laughs> While we do this, my colleagues, uh, Laurent and Karina, uh, the council are going to try to, to compile all the questions as we go through topic um, and put the, and uh, send them over to me so that I can make sure we, we address anything that we haven't covered. Um, all right, so with that said, I think we can kind of get into this. Uh, I want to introduce the folks who are joining us, uh, Tom, Raymond, and Alan. I'm going to start with Tom at GTCom. And uh, Tom, can you introduce the rest of the group? Yeah, I got my video. Hey, guys, how are you? I appreciate being on here. So first off, I'd like to thank Alex, Karina, Laurent, and the, and the members of the Bay Area Council for hosting us. Honored to be able to speak to such a group that's um, influential to the global economy. So I run uh, America for GTCom US. So I run pr predominantly the sales and the marketing vertical. Alan Yan, who's on the line, and you can see his video, he's our CEO. This was his dream to bring this business to the United States. Um, Raymond Zhao, he was instrumental in writing this report. He's head of marketing and our data lab, which kicked off about two months ago. And Eric Liu is a quant anal analyst on, in the data lab that was extremely instrumental in helping create this report as well. So that's, that's the overview of who's on the call. Yes. Yep. So yeah, it's I, my turn. Yeah. So no, no, no. Yeah. yeah do you want to just say yeah. hi, Alan? Yeah. 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 So my name is Alan and CEO of GDCom US, GDCom Technology Corporation. I set up the business of GDCom in the US. Actually our headquarters is based in Beijing. We are in fintech and also a research uh, data analytical companies. So based on our term data and uh, our you know, knowledge, understanding of China situation, the China uh, you know, uh, market. And also we have our data analysts who help us to create a lot of models to analyze the huge amount of data. So that's why we can generate such a report. I think could be useful for you guys, could be uh, a good reference for you guys. Yeah, that's all. So yeah, just a quick little overview of us. So we're headquartered in Santa Clara. We're a FinTech research and data analytics company. We have advanced NLP and strong research methodology using alternative data. So we help our clients identify proper data sources, categorize and tag unstructured data. 
creating the value data sets and deliver in-depth value in form of data sets, dashboard or analytic reports, typically for the financial and capital market industries, but we also support tech companies and corporates on local markets and business strategy in mainland China. So that's why we prepared this presentation. Can you have an, um, let me go over three things. So this, can you go back one right? Sorry, we switched our format around because we're actually gonna be showing a case study instead of just going through a deck. So there's three core elements of our business. So it's the global scope of our alternative data. We are the gateway to China. We have proprietary data and also other data vendors come to us to leverage our US exposure, uh, our multilingual NLP and our machine translation. And for example, with our machine translation algorithms, we have capabilities of 38 languages, which equates to 1,406 language pairs. So just think of the magnitude of the machine translation algos that we have. So for the data coverage, we're known for global sentiment data of news and social media, and we have special agreements with WeChat and Weibo. We onboarded other data sets like I explained before. So we have three years of e-commerce data, online and traditional non-online payment data and online recruiting. Based on those diverse sources, GT, GTCom's data analysis team referred to as our data lab can generate on-demand insights through customized research reports, daily subscription-based reports, and platform access to real-time data and news. So right now, we're going to kick off into the report. Awesome. Tom, thank you so much yeah. for that overview. Um, okay. Yeah, we're getting a, a, I saw that note. Uh, thank you, Kenneth, for uh, a few, few black um, just boxes that are appearing in front of the... Uh, yeah, yeah, I see that as well. <laughs> I thought it was my awesome. crazy screen. But this is a good opportunity to just transition right into the report. Um, is it going to be uh, Raymond, Alan, Tom? Who's, who's going to go through this with us? Hi. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'll, I'll Raymond. kick it off, and then Ray will go through some stuff. Yeah. Wait, why don't you just start to tell us a little about this report? I believe yeah. uh, some, some of you have... Hello? We can hear you, Raymond. Okay, cool. Yeah, you sound good. Yeah. I'm going to uh, go over briefly, go over the, the uh, impact of uh, coronavirus on China's economy. This is a report we uh, did. Uh, we did research. We did for Jeffries, one of the major investment banks, and it's featured by them. So we analyzed the impact of, of the COVID nineteen from the both um, macro and the micro levels. So on the macro level, we created the uh, our unique China Reward Index or CRI which is based on two sub-indices. One is the daily co-consumption index, and another is the personal, personal flow rate index. And the personal, uh, personal flow rate is further based on the urban congestion, which is uh, basically the traffic condition in the city, and the metro passenger volume. So here, here is the Sorry, I will I will enlarge it a bit. So, so this is the most recent one we updated on March twentieth. Uh, so according to our rework index, it sh basically shows that the economic activity in China is recovering to seventy five percent, roughly seventy five percent of uh, comparing to the pre uh, sorry pre epidemic uh, level. And if we go, oh, wait, whoa, 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 hold on, Raymond. There's a lot in there that requires a lot of context. Let's just, just a second. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think for, for a lot of folks, they may mm -hmm. be familiar already with the fact that there is an economic downturn every year uh, during the uh, Chinese uh, Lunar New Year and during Spring Festival. It's about mm -hmm. two weeks, and basically everybody goes home and mm -hmm doesn't buy anything, doesn't go anywhere, doesn't do much for about two weeks. Um, yes. So the, um, the baseline here, um, could you describe what's, what, what each of these lines are comparing the, uh, uh, what, what's following it to? Um, this isn't, we're not using 2019 as a baseline. Everything is being uh, measured against the economic uh, benchmark at minus 15, right? Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Let me let me explain it. And Eric can um, correct me if I I didn't if I did wrong. So basically, we use the uh, uh, fifteen days or two weeks before the Chinese New Year's Day as a, the benchmark. So we take the 
Yeah, and we can as we can see the curves. So when the when the day is close to to zero, which is the Chinese New Year's Day, yeah, it the, the economic activity just goes down, and from the years normal years without the virus outbreak or other condition, you can see the economic activity will bounce back very fast. For example, like in 2019, it takes only like 20 days for the economy to go back to the full operation. But here this year, as 2020, we can clearly see that the, the economic is bad. It's very bad hit by the epidemic. So it remains at a low level for quite a long time and slowly going back. So as a reference though, normally Chinese New Year is two weeks, but because of the coronavirus this year, that was extended out for almost two, um, a month. Is that right? About, about more, than, more than a month than actually. A month. Yeah. Um, so could you kind of indicate to everybody about which day it was on this days following uh, Chinese New Year? that the Chinese New Year actually ended? And um, so you can yes, see, because, yeah. because we use lunar, cal uh, lunar cal calendar, so the exact date is, is different in each year. That's why we didn't use the exact date. But for this year, 2020, the Chinese New Year's Day is uh, January 25th. And so the, uh, the official holiday ends actually one week on uh, February, February 2nd. But the, in some in some areas, yeah, with the tradition, they they uh, have longer holiday. But so, so which extend to February 9th, yeah. That that should be the 14th day after the Chinese New Year's Day. But normally that's the situation. But right now with the, sorry, with the virus outbreak, yeah, this the economic recovery is much longer extended. Sure. I just think it's worth you know, everybody kind of understanding that, mm -hmm. you know, where the normal downturn in, in, uh, is, is kind of hovers around those two weeks. In this case, it wasn't just that the economy was slow to restart, but also that there was just an extended vacation. And that real economic restart isn't really happening until 30, 33, 34 days uh, after uh, day zero rather than yeah. Like, yeah, like I said, we have different sub-indices. Uh, sub so the condition, the, the situation is different. Um, in the, yeah, so yeah, let's go, we can go deeper to see. Sure, and, and just remind everybody, what are the three major indicators that are making up this index? Yeah, one, the first one we're looking at is the co-consumption. So basically we collected the daily co-consumption of the six major uh, power, power generating groups in China. So together, they, a little more in? Sorry, together they take the, the power generation that they, they have is like, it takes like 45 to 50% of the total elect, uh, electricity in China. So they're very, it's a very useful indicator so from from this one we can see the the power the uh, the coal consumption is recovered to more than higher than 80% on uh, as uh, as of march 20th but again it remained a very low level um, like i said until until the beginning of march yeah so I think this one's particularly interesting because you can see that coal consumption doesn't actually dip much further below where it normally would. Um, and as it's recovering, it's, you know, at this point, just a, about what, 15, 20, 20 points under where we're assuming a normal recovery. Um, I think it's also worth mentioning to everybody that, you know, Coal consumption is in China kind of can be an indicator of some very specific economic activity uh, up to 40% uh, or sorry, yeah, up to about 40% of the overall energy grid, excluding obviously uh, oil from cars, et cetera, that, that portion of the energy consumption mix. Um, but about 40% is renewable um, and that is only feeding kind of office residential uh, energy. 
but a lot of coal consumption is manufacturing, kind of used on demand uh, electricity as needed that's close to where power uh, uh, manufacturing plants are. Um, so it's, uh, there's kind of a lot of context to that particular number of coal consumption specifically. It's kind of measuring a certain kind of economic activity that suggests people are going to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, so to have, furthermore, so um, the, co the correlation between the uh, industrial usage of electricity is basically one to one with uh, uh, municipal use. So they're highly correlated. So that's why we believe uh, the co daily coal consumption is, will be a very meaningful indicator to reflect the economic activity, yeah. And the next one is we call what it calls uh, it's the urban congestion index. Basically, it is sh it's based on the um, satellite satellite image and the mobile mobile app usage of the, the mobile map to sh reflect the um, traffic situation within the cities. So, again, this year the the urban congestion rate dropped deeper than the previous years. But so the, it, I think the bottom, yeah, the bottom is only 70% of the pre holiday level. And it takes much longer for them to recover. But right now it's, I mean, again, as of March 20th, it's it already go back to 90% of the normal level. So that shows, it shows that people who own cars actually more willing to go out. But on the other side, the Metro Passenger tr Transportation Index, which reflect the um, daily subway passenger volume, it's really low. So it, we, as we can see, the lowest point is only 7% 7, 7 of the normal level. And it's, it, it's just uh, going back very, very slow. Even now, with the epidemic is easing, it only go back to the 40, roughly 45% of the pre-epidemic value. Okay. Are there, out of curiosity, I don't know if you know the answer to this, Raymond, or Alan, or Tom, or anybody, but, or maybe somebody on the call. Um, mm -hmm. Are there public policies in place that might be restricting people from using public transit? Or is this really an indicator of just trust and you know, fear of being in a congested place with a bunch of people? Oh, yes, actually, uh, for a period of time, so the taxi service, so has been uh, suspended, but right now they're all resumed in, in all cities. Actually, that's part of the reason why the congestion, the congestion uh, index is higher. And for the, for the subway, yes, for cities, cities like Wuhan, they suspended all the subway and uh, bus service until if I'm correct, until um, last Saturday. So, so yeah. So that's why the um, metro passenger volume is heated badly, much worse than the uh, urban congestion. Got it. All right. Thank you, Rick. Yeah. So again, so from the indices, as we can see, the the recovery is, is not very balanced. It's for some of the uh, activities such as uh, urban congestion and uh, coal consumption, they're, they're, they're okay, which reflect the economic activities are going slowly are going back. And furthermore, the coal consumption is with only 82% of a pre-holiday level, which shows that some of the factories are still remaining closed or they must permanently closed due to the you know, virus outbreak. That you, and again, so people who own cars might, might want to go out right now as the situation is, is coming be becoming better. But a lot of people are still avoid the public transportation, especially subways where they have to enter the uh, crowded s space. So that's right. the uh, macro part. So and Raymond, just in summary of all of that, mm -hmm. what 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 is your professional opinion like what can can we be I, everything seems to be slowly trending up um i mean do you guys have you guys been able to extrapolate that into kind of an idea of when at least a level of normalcy will return 
Well, uh, actually, we're going to go over it in the in the slide later, but I can talk it a little bit right now. So, um, the situation is not only about China. So, as we know right now here in the U.S. and in Europe. The, uh, the virus is also spreading and the situation is very tense. So um, the country, China actually uh, tried to reopen some, some of the, like the uh, movie theaters and the, uh, some other red entertaining uh, business. But um, uh, just of yesterday, actually this is our latest update as of yesterday, they, are, they have all the movie theaters cl closed again because there are more, there are more uh, what we call the input case from overseas. I mean, so that, so is that, I, um, gotcha, gotcha. The community transmission isn't being recorded, but we're, we, we, but folks are returning home. Yes. Yeah. So I, Tom could jump in. Hey, this is Tom again. So yeah, so 90% of international flights were slashed and the movie theaters were closed again. The, I guess the bad news, uh, you know, China sort of stabilized before everyone else as being one of the first to get the virus. But um, there has been an uptick. So there was 120 new cases, 40 of which came from, as Ray said, the input cases. So outside of the country. So already the government is acting quickly to um, put in some policies and mandates. And hopefully other parts of the world will see this as well, right? Because if China's the kind of like leader in this of, of facing this first, other governments can speculate and, you know, work on their policies around this. And there's another, I, and Alex, I know you want to keep this positive. So uh, for local okay. news. Truth for, over positivity. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. But for local <laughs> news in New York, which has been getting hit very hard, and one thing Ray Hope, Governor Cuomo noted that while cases continue to rise, the rate at which they are doubling is slow to every six days after standing less than two weeks ago at every two days. So you are seeing how other governments and municipalities can look at, you know, past results of what people have been doing. So later on in the deck, like after we go out of this case study, we can show you some of the policies that we analyze for the next step. <clears throat> Great. Yeah. All right, so now we're gonna take a look at a bit of like a snapshot of what was happening just going into Chinese New Year this year. As a lot of folks know, of course, the, the Wuhan outbreak started before Chinese New Year. Um, so there was a lot of anticipation heading into that of you know, what might happen. Um, and these, and uh, you know, Tom Allen and Ray found kind of some very interesting metrics to look at um, to kind of show what people were doing, um, both kind of going into and then immediately after the announcement of the extended holiday. Yep. So, <coughs> sorry. So the, yeah, the coronavirus while also pushed the, you know, what we call the lifestyle change in China in, in many ways. So, so we analyze what different um, aspects of people's life. For, first of all, it's grocery delivery. So, um, Normally, people are more used to buy the uh, the fresh food from the local market in China, but as the most the communities were quarant under quarantine, quarantine, and people cannot just cannot go out to to buy groceries. So the food the grocery delivery is business is boost boosted, and we can see it from uh, different ways. For first of all, it's from uh, based on our news volume on grocery delivery. So as you can see. Um, although it's a very, already a very hot topic topic before because many of the startups are into this area, but still there's an increased trend of the volume, news volume, and also the sentiment is mainly positive. There, so there are a few days there, there are more negative news because the quarantine caused a lot of chaos when the delivery uh, pers pe people cannot enter the community, things like that, but overall they're good. And, and so Raymond, this data is mostly sourced from WeChat, is that right? Uh, no, uh, there are two parts. This one right now, what we're looking is from uh, our uh, just news only. Yeah. Okay. And, and then we have the news, the sentiment, um, sorry, the post from the social media, that's from Weibo and WeChat. As we can see, before the Chinese New Year or the January 23rd, 
when the government officially shut down the Wuhan city, <laughs> so there are only a few 100 or so posts every day. But this, right after that, there's a big spike on the social media. People are yeah, become very hot topic. And we just analyzed the geographic distribution of the social media posts where, where the people post them. So as we can see, Wuhan or Hubei province is the number top city because that's the center of the epidemic. And other tier one cities like Shang, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou also they, uh, have the have high volume of the uh, social media posts. And, and shows is, the, sorry, so, so and I mean, this is higher than normal. I, I mean, I think a lot of folks uh, will, will probably already know that China is the largest e-commerce uh, market in the world. Um, it was $1.5 trillion last year. Uh, a lot of people were already pretty prepared to, uh, you know, were already embraced delivery of a lot of things, but, you know, groceries included. And it seems like this has just kind of pushed that last echelon of folks who are kind of slow adopters over the edge. So, I mean, is there some impact, some implications for, you know, all the brick and mortar, you know, the, 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 grocery stores um, that, you know, I mean, do people go back after this? Well, yes, people still going to uh, grocery stores, but actually the traditional chain, uh, the, like the uh, grocery market, supermarket, they also introducing their own um, food delivery service. So I will just quickly show you an example. So which we tracked some the downloading performance of the, of the, Delivers for deliveries, uh, sorry, grocery delivery service. So, so this one, uh, Yong, the segment, Yonghui, it's a tra traditional supermarket, superstore, but after they introduced their own um, mobile app, as we can see, the download is also spiked uh, uh, around the Chinese New Year. So, yeah, that means a lot, even the, the offline business, they're, they're transforming because of the coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so and yeah, we uh, analyze the new new user growth. We just take the uh, fresh fresh Homa and the uh, Jingdong as two examples because they are the largest ones. Fresh Homa is uh, by Alibaba and yeah Jingdong. So so each day since January twenty third, they they go in like uh, from lower ten uh, ten thousand to forty thousand. Every just every day, and it just go higher and higher day by day. Yeah. Yeah, and again, I think this just begs the question: what what happens after this? Uh, you know, with so many people already using those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this um, basically means yeah, most the, of China is using. Yeah, the the gross, grocery delivery is kind of different than other um, other e-commerce, as I said. So uh, people before this, <coughs> sorry, people before this. Uh, People are still more used to buy from the local market to buy uh, fresh groceries, but right now they're they're put they're forced to use to 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 adopt this uh, new uh, apps or new services, and I believe that it it will continue and become a habit new habit. But we are, that's why we're continuing to track the, the, this. Uh, uh, yeah, it'd be really interesting to see an update on this. I see this ends on, uh, you know, February 6th. This just kind of tracks through Chinese New Year. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it'd be great to check back on this like a month, two months from now and, and yeah. see what it looks like. Hey, Alex, it's Tom speaking again. It was very hey, interesting. Tom. We actually monitor the social sentiment around the, um, the online grocery delivery and it was volatile. You would get negative comments because due to say not using it and not knowing how to use the platform and then not being able to get deliveries to you due to some quarantine policies of your area. So it is overall trending positive and downloads are going down, but the, it's like the jury's still out there on if it's going to be a preferred method, mm -hmm. but it has generally, you've seen the uptick in positivity, but there was some negative comments. Gotcha. So, well, yeah, well, the online business is booming. The offline business is uh, hit badly. So this, 
we because we have the payment data available, so we can we we um, this uh, we we analyze the restaurant business activities. So as we can see, the the blue bar is the uh, the revenue of 2020. Uh, 2020 for the whole uh, restaurant business sector. So it's much, much lower than the 2019 level. And uh, yeah, and the curve is just shows the uh, the business activity, yeah. Right. I mean, this one is particularly I, I kind of troubling, I guess. I mean, I don't know how many, I, I know if, if anybody has spent any bit significant time in China, I know a lot of folks on the call have, a big part of any day is spent in restaurants, um, especially if you're if you're visiting. Um, so, I would. Uh, this is another one I would love for us to keep track of. Maybe in a couple weeks, do an update mm -hmm. um, and see what it looks like going through. You know, early April. Uh, it's just I'm gonna say it's hard for me to imagine China without people going to restaurants all the time. Yeah, of course. Okay, yeah. Um, the second area we analyze is uh, film and theater. Actually, it's more broader as the entertainment uh, sector. So even though the, uh, the online entertainment platforms have become very popular, the, the movie or theater is still, still an important role in the entertainment industry. So as again, the total box office in 2019 was over Two, uh, sorry, 64 billion RMB. So that's uh, a little bit less than um, 1 billion US dollar, but still that's very high in China. But this year, the whole industry is going through a very tough time. Again, we can see that the daily news volume on the film industry just uh, become higher. Again, at, around the Chinese New Year and after the uh, virus outbreak. And the sentiment is very negative because the whole industry is worried about the performances. And then the reason why is we can see from the monthly box office, the whole country, the box office in February and uh, March, the whole country is only a few million RMB, which is- And, 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 and but theaters are open again, right? Uh, they just opened for a few days, and right now they're they're closed again. Okay, so that's 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 like one could ex we could expect that to be zero for a little while longer. Again, it's kind of hard sometimes with these situ with these these statistics to kind of separate what is you know people reacting to the 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 situation they're going through and what is you know just a government policy that's preventing you know a, a, an industry from moving forward. Yeah. So there. Yeah. As a result, a lot of the movies they decided to to uh, postpone their or or just cancel so uh, move to the online platforms. I think the same thing is happening here in the U.S. Like the uh, the latest James Bond movie is already delayed to um, November, I believe. Yeah. And again, the online <laughs> businesses platforms have a really good time. For example, uh, these are the major um, online entertainment apps we use, like TikTok, Kwaisho, it's a short video. Uh, ITE is, our, it's, it's a, um, so something close to Netflix. They have their own uh, movies, TVs, yeah, and shows. And Tencent Video is a competitor. So uh, what's worth noting is like TikTok um, higher, much higher uh, daily active user than other platforms. So one reason is that uh, it's partnered with uh, the CCTV or television for the Chinese New Year Gala. It's a very uh, tradition for, for probably the whole country to watch the, the, the show on Chinese New Year's Eve. So also, it, I think this is the very first time they purchased the Lost in Russia. It's a direct by a very famous Chinese director. and it, they bought it for 600 million RMB and show it on the platform for free. That brought it a lot of attention like, and the new users. I mean, yeah, they, that, that just went up. I mean, it, these other platforms look like there's just a lot of fluctuation, I mean, to my eye. 
where I, I mean, TikTok just kind of went up and never came down again. Yeah. And next is online teaching and uh, education. So the same thing is happening here as the schools are all closed, the teachers are, are teaching on, um, online. I, I think Tom knows that better than I do. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> again, the, um, the news volume goes up as the school is supposed to, to uh, reopen. But uh, as the government, sorry, okay, as the government mandated, so they remain closed, and all the teaching activities are, are moved to online. So the sentiment is again, it is some somehow negative first, and then just jump to the very positive. Could you, um, sorry, Tom, is there anything, can you add some context to that? I mean, again, like, I don't think it'll come as a surprise to anybody that online education use spikes during a time when people can't go to school. Um, are there, I, I, and I understand at this time, many schools still have not, some have, but many schools, especially at uh, educate primary, I'm sorry, elementary and middle schools are still not in session. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of what does positive sentiment actually kind of reflect in this context? Like people are enjoying using these types of tools and thus people will conceptually continue to want to use them. Uh, or is it just, hey, it's great to not have to go to school. <laughs> no. So, yeah. So the reason Ray made that comment towards me is my wife's actually a teacher. So and I think this is a global um, issue it's um so like as business people we're used to zoom and we're used to webex for the online learning you're always going to have that hey what do we do we have these platforms and i believe google has a ton too um as you guys would know in the bay area so it's like you know the adoption is just like kind of like we said with online groceries people who haven't used the app if they can't get deliveries in this case you haven't really used the online learning you're not accustomed to it you you, you have internet problems or you know, underprivileged areas, things like that. So you're gonna have some fluctuation on it. But once, generally, once it starts moving and operating and people work out the kinks, they find out that it's a very good platform and they okay. are built. So, so it's kind of- something yeah. predictive in that. Yeah. yeah. And it's kind of funny as you brought it up, I think if this happened 10 years ago or 15 years ago, it wouldn't have been as easy. You know, we all have cameras now, uh, you know, multiple front facing cameras that we, some people don't even use until now. So. Like I said, I think um, the online learning will be positive, generally speaking. But people obviously do love interaction, but at least we know there is a substitute and we're not idle. I mean, it, it is uh, interesting that we've been in this situation now for, I feel, I, I think a lot of people would agree with it. We, these tools have been for around for a long time. Yeah. We've, the adoption has, you know, how do you, how do you get people to adopt to this kind of thing? And obviously we're experiencing that with a ton of different services here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, again, one more of these things that would be great for us to follow up on in you know, a month, two months, even like six months from now, just to see if we, if we could see data reflecting like real decision change, real behavioral changes that come out of this event. Sorry, go ahead, Ruben. Yeah. And um, yeah, I just wanna to try to show the, uh, the social media posts shows the same trend as the uh, uh, news does. So again, there's a <clears throat> spike after the uh, virus outbreak and when it closed to the uh, sc school season. And the uh, sentiment, it's also becoming positive. So yeah. And we just show because, yeah, because of the uh, online teaching is mandated, mandated by the government. So we we'll basically show the user distribution is very even, somehow very even ar around the country. But again, there are um, what we call the, the underdeveloped provinces or autonomous re uh, regions such as Tibet, Xinjiang, or Inner Mongolia have lower user. So that may reflect the uneven development of the um, structure or the um, teaching the apps. Right. And yeah, we just take some uh, 
examples. So TAL is a public traded company in NASDAQ. So it's one of the leading platforms. And yeah, the uh, user has jumped from less than 1 million to more than 11 million. So yeah, we understand that there should be more scientific way to do that is to compare the year over year uh, change uh, because of the uh, limit limit of data source we have, we just could we could only do this year. But still, there's somehow you can show you the sense how um, these online uh, platforms uh, perform. Yeah. Has, has there been like a regional policy of these companies done? Are they being mandated for use by certain school systems? Um, uh, it's more choice of the teachers. They're more uh, eat, which one they're more used to. Some some of the uh, like I said, some of the teachers may even use the Ding Talk in, uh, by Alibaba. So it's normally used by business people, but right now because of it has a function to check the attendance, yeah, it, it's even adopted by the school and teachers. So it's more, it's, I don't think there's a mandatory policy to say, okay, you have to use this or that. Yeah. It's cool. Teachers are just kind of deciding whichever one they like most and then having their classes use that. Exactly, yes. And, and for reference, for everybody who's never gone to school in, in China, or maybe I think quite a few places in Asia, your teacher is kind of your teacher with the same class or maybe multiple grades. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a little easier to disaggregate that instead of, you know, if middle school in the US, high school in the US, where you're going to have a bunch of different teachers using maybe different, different software platforms. Um, yeah, again, from the uh, DAU perspective, there's another one has a better performance. So the ZY Bang, it's a, a startup spin off the from Baidu. So it, unlike the TL, it's more uh, integrated, uh, integrated or the, the focus on the K-12 field. So that's why it have um, better performance than the, than the TL, yeah. So last one come to, uh, it's more re uh, related to us, the remote work. So um, so I think the, the working culture in China is uh, quite different than here in the US. So the work from home is not something very common back there. So again, from the news and the social, we could see that the, uh, the news volume is very, very low for the uh, virus outbreak. But after the new, uh, spring festival holiday end, so as people have to have to work from home, so the news volume just jumped higher. Hey, Rain, just one second uh, before we. What, what, someone did have a question. Just for some 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 color to this uh, uh, remote education topic. Um, okay. Are and to my knowledge, for the most part, pe uh, kids are kind of required to just have access to their own laptops, phones, etc. Um, do you know if schools provide any of that? Uh, so that in, in, in this new kind of crisis situation to make sure they're tracking it, or is it just the responsibility of parents to make sure their kids have what they need? Yeah, as for, for um, the new, what we learned is there's no um, policy for schools so, so to, to uh, provide such equipment to, to uh, students. So basically it's, they have to uh, prepare it by, by themselves. But on the other hand, uh, because the smartphone is is very very it's a common uh, popular in China, so almost everyone will have have it. So the student, even if the student themselves don't have it, they can use their parents' phone, yeah, or okay. or laptop, yeah. That was my understanding too. I'd actually I'd, I'd never heard of a school providing that kind of thing for students, but uh, you know that's not to rest on assumptions. Mm -hmm. right. Sorry, go ahead, Raymond. Yeah. Again, yeah. Uh, uh, that's the news volume and the sentiment, and we've uh, analyzed the, the user distribution again. So um, still, as you can see, the tier one cities or uh, or the like Beijing or the sorry or, or the coastal provinces have the higher uh, user, which shows that people in these areas or or companies in 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 these areas are more willing to adopt this uh, work from home poli uh, policy. Uh, again, we show the top 50, top 50 cities with a social media post. So again, Beijing, Guangzhou, Shanghai, 
<laughs> got familiar with that. Yeah. So honestly, I'm kind of surprised Wuhan is ranking so low. <laughs> yeah, because people they are still you know, being fi- the priority is still fighting the virus. There, right. So even even under the virus outbreak or the epidemic conditions, so still the, the tier one cities or economically well developed areas are more likely to adopt such a uh, remote work policy. Yeah. Great. And we just uh, track the performance of several uh, popular apps like the like Ding Talk, yeah, Tencent Meeting, yeah, and the WeChat for Enterprise. Yeah, they just constantly ranked top five during the um, epidemic. And last, yeah, these are the top firms, but also we analyzed the performance of some startups. So for example, the XY Link is an online meeting provider, which they, I believe they provide a similar service as Zoom does. So again, the, the user just jump after the people's- but Why is, why is XY Link outperforming Shimo so badly? Um, I think because due to the, the nature, people are still willing to talk to each other. So as they, as they have the, this, this meeting option, huh, they're more willing to use it instead of you know, chatting with each other. Mm-hmm. And then, plus, Shimo is just uh, uh, the document with, uh, yeah. Got it. Right. Got it. Well, yeah. thanks so, for all of this, Ray. Yeah, this that's the, super the, interesting. What we analyzed, yeah, regarding the impact of the coronavirus. And awesome. yeah, and I mean, I would, I would really like to do a follow up on this at some point. I feel like, yeah, I mean, there's a lot that, you, especially some of these, just to see what some of these snapshots are going to look like in, you know, again, a month, two months. Uh, I would, re- I'm, I would love to see, you know, and and we could work on this sometime maybe, but uh, to, to see if there are real behavioral changes. Um, that come out of this. And again, China has gone through pan, you know, ep- epidemics more recently than we have. I think for a lot of us, it's kind of hard to imagine this not having behavioral changes, but you know, China's coming at this from a bit of a different perspective. Obviously, they haven't had one that's been this dramatic in quite a while. Mm-hmm. But it's a little bit less of a foreign concept. Um, we are a little over time, at least over the time where I was hoping. Um, so we just had a couple of, one, one last question. Um, Let's do, and that's a tough one, Richard. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know if there, have you guys found a way to kind of filter for maybe when government announcements um, have been released and then how those affect the positivity or negativity of, of some of the results you've gotten? I mean, I, I know, I'm sure it, it, I, it's, it's maybe, I'm not saying that you've done that already. I'm just wondering, is that even possible? Well, we're tracking the policies, so we're going to do continued research on that. And we have yeah. some examples. Let's yeah. show you, yeah, very quickly. So, yeah, this is a, we, what we, ha- we did. So we, we closely tracked the uh, policy, the supporting policies released by the government. So, and we, with our NLP technology, we categor- categorize them into five different types of policies. The executive action, which uh, to uh, simplify the, the, the pr- process for the uh, when people are business dealing with government, the financial support, um, they're either direct uh, direct monetary policy or like the uh, te- uh, what what is the the other one anyway yeah the tax relief so again there's either a tax cut or postpone the tax payment and rent reduction. Because some uh, some of the businesses they, they might uh, rent the government government owned building, so the government government is encouraged uh, uh, to let them pay less for the rent, or they also encourage the commercial t- uh, building tenant uh, landlord to uh, re- reduce the ten- uh, rent for the tenant. And last is the human resource. Basically, it's uh, to protect the right of employee and and uh, employer during the um, virus outbreak. Um, you know, guys, I feel like, you know, I, I do feel like the policy side of this is a, a yet another whole really interesting part of it. Um, mm-hmm. And so instead of, 
and instead of taking the whole time to kind of go through it, which we would like to do, do you have a couple of just kind of examples of some of the policies? Of course, of course, yes. Yeah. And Richard, so, I know this doesn't totally answer your question, um, but I, I mean, basically, I think we would have to go back, kind of overlay, you know, when those policies came out against when, you know, against social media reaction. Um, yeah. So again, so the, the all the original policy are published uh, in chi in Chinese, so we can help translate them with our machine translation capability to lo lower your language barrier. And for example, uh, <clears throat> this one is a policy re released by the Ministry of Human Resource and the Social Security. So basically, it's to protect the, the right of employees, the right of employees during the period of epidemic prevention and the set of control. So that's the uh, uh, central government level policy and it's targeting all industries. And we also have the policies released by the provincial, go uh, pr provincial government and we, what we call it the industrial uh, specific policies. So for example, Hainan province is famous for its uh, tourism industry and it's more like the Florid Florida in China where, where people go spend their uh, winter vacation. And this year is Again, it's a tough year because of the virus. So the, gov the provincial government released the uh, policies specifically support the tourism industry. And one last thing, it's a very hot topic right now, is the new infrastructure stimulus plan. So the, the it's, it's not something new, but with this year, the current government is going to re um, release more like 13 provinces already released their uh, investment plan on over 10,000 projects in the, the specific this year and it's some highlighted sectors such as 5G base station, high, ultra high voltage transmission, big data centers and like that. We, yeah, we have some uh, detailed coverage uh, and I mean follow up analysis on this policy and we can with our um, big data capability we can help you to analyze the thematic from different perspective. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Raven. Um, and, you know, Tom, Alan, Raven, thanks so much for kind of putting this presentation together, walking us through this report. I found a lot of it really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. I would love to do a dig into some of the public policies that have been making a really big difference uh, mm -hmm. and the ones that haven't been making a big difference. Of course, you know, not everything is analogous to what we could be doing here. Um, just helpful to see kind of what the impacts are. Um, for everybody left on the phone, um, on Thursday, we are gonna have another one of these conversations. Um, our next one will be with uh, um, Kevin Chu, chairman of Maybow. He's gonna talk a little about policies that he's seen uh, that have made a difference and uh, talk a little bit about a platform they're working on to help predict where uh, medical supplies are gonna be needed the most. And then following that next week, we're working on uh, putting together an interview with the deputy director of the city of Nanjing. Um, so that uh, uh, to give us just kind of a, a, a ground eye perspective of metropolitan policies that have been making a difference from the people who've been putting them on. Uh, Tom, Alan, Raymond, uh, any, if you want to just make a couple of remarks, thanks so much for putting this together. Um, but uh, yeah, keep this up. No, just to answer Richard. So yeah, so this the report you saw was picked up by a major investment bank. So we update that and distribute that to them weekly, even though we could do it daily. And the next iteration of the report will be more around the major infrastructure and policies. So we're going to continue with that, you know, this case study, and then that'll branch off. Yeah, and for me, uh, you know, this is our first case studies we created for for Jeffries and also for other financial investment companies. Uh, next week, we are, we are we working on a, another case studies to analyze and check the China new infrastructure uh, investments policies, because that is uh, a very, very important for the, not only for China companies, but as well as for the uh, US companies, global companies. So yeah, if you want to know more, uh, will you share uh, the next second case study with you guys? And, and just as we close, could you, uh, um, Alan or Raymond, uh, could you just put up the contact information so folks know how to get a hold of you if they're kind of interested in more about this? Um, we also want to make sure that folks have access to the report, you know, if they kind of want to read through it themselves. Okay, I saw that. Registered the forum. Yes, okay, saw that. Awesome. Awesome. Um, well, everybody, thanks so much for joining us for the first one of these. Um, we're going to 
try to be do making this a bit more of a regular, you know, part of uh, part of the Bay Area Council China Initiatives uh, content. Um, and uh, you know, let us know your feedback and you know, stay healthy out there. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good day.